how to use tactical pens, flashlights, uh, basically improvised weapons that would also qualify if you drew your knife, but maybe you're not quick enough to get the knife open, so you have to use the knife closed until you can get it open. Same concept would apply. So anything you can grip in your hand, be able to hit with as an improvised weapon. But I'd like to start off with some of the empty hand against knife, uh, the CBC stuff that's becoming an increasing problem, um, not only as far as criminal stuff, but also with terrorists and everything else. So the idea of being able to survive somebody attacking you with a knife. So again, the most common attack you'll have is someone grab and stabbing, and it's gonna be a multiple stabs coming up this way. If you look on YouTube, you look at um, Live leak, any of the, the video sites out there, you'll see closed circuit TV videos of people being attacked. That should be your inspiration. That should be the, the type of stuff that you look at and you say, okay, that's the problem that I need to solve. So whatever technique you use, base it on understanding that problem, the reality of it. Don't let somebody say, okay, well, somebody will attack you like this. No, they won't. They'll attack you the way it works best for them as the attacker. So the attack is gonna be the low angle five. Nico comes in with a low angle five. My defense is to stop with what we call a split X. So we have one hand high, one hand low. Notice that my hands are open, my thumbs point up, and I want to use the backs of my arms as the major contact surface. I'm also using the bones of my arms as structure. You'll see this sometimes, people blocking this way. Okay, Krav Maga many times will use this type of block. The problem is as soon as I bend my elbows, the muscles do the work. When I straighten my arms, the bones do the work. The bones will always be stronger. Also, the longer his knife, the more I have to have extension here. If I let this bend, it's more likely that I get stabbed, especially for guys who are well fed. I stop here. Next step, I hook the back of the elbow. The reason for this, I want to limit his arm mobility just to the shoulder joint. If I try to control down here, he has two joints to move, he gets the knife back, I lose. Okay, but if he thrusts, I stop here. Now I've controlled this to one joint. Even if he's pulling back, I can control. And I now have two arms against one, again, using the, mus using the bones instead of the muscles. Stop, hook. The next step, pull this tight to my body. Get it close to my body where I'm strongest. This hand, waving goodbye to Nico. This one, shaking hands. Put the hands together this way. Now, <clears throat> skeletal structure. Everything is very strong because you're using the bones. My name is Michael Janich, and I'm the founder and lead instructor of Martial Blade Concepts and Counter Blade Concepts. And my martial arts training goes back to uh, my early teens. Uh, I began training when I was about 12 or 13 years old, and I started off in Western boxing. Uh, I was very interested in martial arts. I grew up in the Chicago area, and uh, it was during the, the height of the Bruce Lee era. It was also in an area where having self-defense skills was very useful in our neighborhood. Um, so the, the first traditional martial arts training, or the first formal martial arts training I had was an American self-protection. It was a hybrid system that included elements of Judo, Aikido, Savat, and Western boxing. And the instructors that I had for that system also had a lot of training in other martial arts. So. In addition to learning ASP, I also had the benefit of kind of cherry picking the best of their instruction. They would often share things with us as far as extra teaching at the end of a, a lesson. So picked up elements of traditional karate, picked up elements of judo, uh, taekwondo, savat, a number of other systems. And then when I was 17, I joined the army. I uh, was working in intelligence. I was a Chinese Mandarin and Vietnamese linguist and had the opportunity to travel around to many different posts and train with different people who, again, had experience in different martial arts styles. And it was more of an informal training where they were sharing their favorite elements of the arts that they had learned. So it was a really nice way to experience a lot of different martial arts, see kind of the best elements of the different arts without being restricted to one particular system. Uh, my, probably the most intense formal training I've had has been in the Filipino martial arts, specifically Serata Eskrima. When I was stationed in Hawaii, uh, had the opportunity to study Serata. I was very interested in the Filipino arts, so basically completed an instructor certification program in, in Serata. And uh, since then, have also had the opportunity to train with other Filipino martial artists, so that really is the focus of my training. But uh, one of the, the most um, beneficial periods, I guess, of training in my life I worked for Paladin Press from 1994 to 2004, and I ran their video production department. And while working in that capacity, I had the ability to work with some amazing martial artists and amazing practitioners and military combatives, people like James Keating, Kelly Warden, uh, Kelly McCann. And in presenting their information, I also had the opportunity, again, to cherry pick the things that I felt were most useful 
And I combined that with my analytical skills. I was a trained analyst, worked at the National Security Agency when I was in the military, and taking that analytical process and what I'd learned from the martial arts, that's what I used to create the system that I practice today. Martial Blade Concepts is basically my approach to self-defense with knives. The idea is to have a practical system that works for today's needs. So a lot of the, the basic techniques of MBC are based on the Filipino martial arts. When you go back to things that have been proven for centuries in edge weapon combat, the Filipino martial arts do that extremely well. The problem with the Filipino arts is that in many cases, the application of force is not consistent with modern self-defense. So when you look at the legal aspects of self-defense, when you look at being responsible and ethical in the use of force, that's where the Filipino techniques are not quite as good. Also, you have to take into consideration the types of knives that people are actually allowed to carry legally. So many martial arts systems use large knives, they use knives that culturally were appropriate hundreds of years ago. But when you look at what people can actually carry now, a small folding knife, something that is legal for them to have in their pocket, you start off with that particular knife and you say, okay, this is the weapon that I will use. The next step is to figure out what type of damage that weapon can cause, basically quantify its destructive ability. And then based on that, you have to focus on stopping power. And that's another one of the things where there's a lot of misinformation in the martial arts as far as the use of knives or edge weapons. What you want to do in self-defense is to stop the threat. Once you stop the threat, once you're able to keep yourself safe and create distance, you're finished. It's not a battlefield situation where you're trying to, to win as a, as a soldier or a combatant. Um, it's all about keeping yourself safe. So the idea of being able to stop people reliably and effectively, that takes knowledge of human anatomy. And that's one of the other things that I've looked at uh, very diligently. I've worked with instructors from the International School of Tactical Medicine, worked with very high level uh, trauma doctors to figure out what vulnerabilities the, the human body has to knives and how to exploit those vulnerabilities to stop people. So NBC is all about essentially taking the knife and using it as a responsible self-defense weapon. So one of the things we can do is starting with this position here is being able to move the arm to the opposite side. Let's say that I just don't want to be on the inside, okay? Or I've tried to do this and I'm realizing it's not working the way I want. What I want to do is move the knife over here. So all I did was I took my initial stop, I moved the arm down below his elbow, so between his elbow and wrist. My left arm dissolves, it comes back to my body, and I move over here. You say, well, what good is that? Well, first of all, if I just stick my fingers in his eyes here, maybe stomp his knee, now my turn to play. One of the big differences between self-defense and the practice of traditional martial arts is that in the martial art, many cases, the art itself is more important than the practitioner and people kind of lose sight of the element of self-defense. And you can train in martial arts for many reasons. If you want a, a cultural experience, if you want fitness, if you simply want to do something to interact with other people, that's fine. But when it comes to self-defense, it has to be practical and it has to be something that works for you. And you should try to, as much as possible, stack the odds in your favor based on where you live. So if you can carry a weapon, if you can carry something that you can use to be able to be more effective in self-defense and be able to do so with less training, Obviously, you want to be safe as soon as possible. You don't want to have a curriculum that promises you in five years you'll have the skill to be able to, to be safe. If you're attacked between now and then, it's not a good thing. So what you want to do is really look at the training that you seek out and try to find instructors who will train people with average physical abilities. You don't have to be a super athlete to be able to do their system. You want to look at instructors who are really concerned with self-defense versus the idea of a martial arts uh, type of pursuit or a sporting pursuit. Um, and just really focus on your needs to keep yourself safe. When you see something that doesn't fit your needs, move on. One of the other aspects that separates self-defense from martial arts is the idea that you have to be practicing things that are appropriate to where you're living or working. So when you look at the laws that regard um, the carry of weapons, of course, we're the good guys, so we have to play by the rules. We want to make sure that whatever weapons we choose are appropriate for our area. They're legal to carry. We're not violating any laws by trying to keep ourselves safe. And when you look at the differences in various states in the U.S., the primary difference is the size of the blade that you can carry with a particular knife. So all of the techniques in NBC are basically designed to still function and still work appropriately, even with the smallest legally allowable knives. My daughter lives in Boston. When I travel to visit her, I carry a knife with a two and a half inch blade because that's what, what is allowed there. My mother lives in Chicago. When I travel there, same thing, two and a half inch blade. If I can carry a longer knife when I'm back home in Colorado, 
I carry a longer knife. Now, when it comes to other countries, for example, teaching here in France, lock blade knives are not allowed here. So to carry a knife that has a locking blade is inappropriate. Well, the basic techniques of MBC can also be performed with a knife that does not have a locking blade. Of course, you have to be careful to make sure that you, you don't do anything that would cause the blade to close, but the, the fundamental techniques, the core techniques of the system actually will work with a non-locking blade. And that focus on cutting is also something that is more appropriate for French law. When you have any type of a, a stab wound or a puncture wound, often it's uh, viewed as a, a much more uh, lethal attack, something that is a, a higher level of force, whereas cutting is viewed as more of a, a defensive action. And that's something that's appropriate for French law. NBC is designed to work with the laws, to work with all the different variations. So again, self-defense is all about keeping yourself safe. Depending on your personal circumstances, you can adapt NBC to meet your needs. Although I'm best known for martial blade concepts and counter blade concepts, um, I practice all aspects of self-defense. So empty hand technique, stick technique, firearms, I include everything. And most of my private students, most of the people who have become instructors with me, um, they started off training with me because of the knife. And that was what I started teaching publicly at first. Once we started training on a regular basis, they saw that I also had a complete empty hand system, again, based on my analysis of, of practical self-defense. And they really liked it, but there was no name for it. They said, what are we doing? I said, well, we're doing empty hand techniques. And they kept asking me for a name because when they would talk to their friends and say, oh, I study martial arts, the first question is, oh, what, what art do you study? We had no name for the empty hand system. And uh, if you go back and quote Bruce Lee, a name is just a name. I didn't feel it was important. They felt it was very important. And uh, I've always been a, uh, a big fan of Penjak Silat, Indonesian martial arts. I, I believe that there's a, a great wealth of information in those arts if you take the time to analyze them and draw the information out. One day I was training with one of my students and I got him in a joint lock. And we had just had a conversation about naming the art. And his response as he was being cranked in the lock was, damn, it hurts a lot. And I'm like, wait a minute, that was my epiphany, that was my inspiration. So I said, okay, Dami Turt Silat became the name for our system. It was kind of a joke, but it stuck. So the empty hand system is Dami Turt Silat. The stick system is So Bad I Want to Scream. Damn, it hurts a lot, so bad I want to scream. Okay, so I can use that to get to my knife. And this is one of the things about MBC that is different also. Yesterday we start training, everyone has their knife. Great but I don't walk down the street like this waiting for someone to attack, at least not for very long before someone calls the police. So <clears throat> what you have to have is the ability to get your knife out and get your knife into action quickly. If I'm being attacked here, I have to live long enough to do that. So we call that earning your draw. So if you're practicing your draw stroke, this type of thing comes first. Then you say, okay, I put fingers in his eyes, now I step back, I draw. If he's still fighting, great. If he can't see, boom, I run, okay? But let's see how to finish this empty hand. So we stop here, we move it here. Notice that I'm ready for him to come back. If I do this pass and I let this arm be lazy, yeah, no, no good. So this is here, pass, ready to do on this side. Now what I'm doing is driving 30 degrees this way. I reach up and under, and now I have the control on the back of the arm. Where have you seen this before? The other arm, exactly, yesterday. So when the left arm was reaching, had the left arm reach to grab it. This was here, and we had this control. Back of the arm, same control. Well, in this case, angle three, please. I pass to here, and now have the control here. This is now a mirror image of what we had before. So now, left hand, shaking hands, right hand, waving goodbye to Nico. So if we do see, oh, to here, my left arm is on the back of his tricep, but same basic lock, same position. So now you have to look at how do I finish from here. My finish, I love this one. Nice ankle break right there, or just take him straight down onto his face. So again, three comes in, stop, pass, look, right to here. And again, this is just beautiful from here. Nice one too. If we imagine Nico's hand on the ground here, kick the wrist. So step on the hand, kick the wrist to break the wrist. After I worked with Paladin Press, I went to work for Black Hawk Products Group. And actually the way that started, uh, back in 1998, I was one of the first knife designers for the Masters of Defense Knife Company. 
And when Black Hawk purchased Masters of Defense, they wanted to bring somebody on board who could run the company uh, when the founder of the company retired. So they hired me to come on board for product development. I eventually took over management of both Masters of Defense and Black Hawk Blades. So I've been involved in knife design uh, for about 20 years. And uh, that was kind of my move into the tactical uh, knife industry. And around 2000, I was living in Colorado, still working for Paladin Press. Spyderco, which is located in Golden, Colorado, uh, wanted to have a knife self-defense program. So they basically, what began uh, as Marshall Blade Craft, which was a Spyderco coin term, uh, is what evolved into Marshall Blade Concepts. So they adopted my curriculum in 1999. I taught for them from 1999 to 2004. And then when I went to work for Blackhawk, because it was a different knife company, we wanted to, to make sure there was no conflict of interest. So we, we parted friends. But my current full-time job is actually as the Special Projects Coordinator for Spyderco. So I do all of their product education, I do photography, videography, um, all of their, their writing, and uh, I still do some knife design for them as well. So I have several Spyderco designs that are currently in, uh, in manufacture. And uh, as part of my involvement in the show, I also wrote a book called The Best Defense. It's available through Amazon, uh, and it basically just pr presents a lot of the basic information as far as different types of threats and how to deal with those threats practically as far as modern self-defense.